government cartels, a heist of historic proportions, Canada's Fort Knox, and maple syrup. No, we're not talking about the weirdest episode of Narcos on Netflix. We're talking about the very real Great Canadian Maple Syrup Heist of 2012. Maple syrup is an uncontested Canadian icon. Our prime ministers bring it with them as gifts when they travel overseas. We melt it over snow and eat it frozen off a stick. And heck, the maple leaf is front and center in the middle of our national flag. But the maple syrup business is also incredibly lucrative. One barrel of syrup, which is about 500 pounds, can be worth up to $1,800, which is up to 20 times the price of a barrel of oil. Canada produces over 80% of the world's supply of maple syrup. In 2016, Canada produced over 73 million kilograms, or 80,000 tons, of syrup from producers both big and small. Whether it's a mom-and-pop sugar shack that taps a handful of trees the traditional way with a hammer and a bucket, or a large-scale operation with vein-like tubes running from tree to tree, sucking sap from sunup to sundown, the Canadian industry exported over $372 million of syrup to the rest of the world. However, Quebec is hands down Canada's maple syrup powerhouse. It produces about 90% of Canada's production, which is about 70% of the world's entire stock of the sweet sticky stuff. Today, some 7,500 producers work with over 13,500 farmers across Quebec to produce upwards of 30 million liters or 8 million gallons of the stuff every single year. But wherever there's money to be made, there are going to be people that are going to try to play that system. And this is one of those stories. But to get there, we're going to have to go back in time a little bit. In the 1930s, it was actually the northeastern U.S. states like Vermont that produced most of the world's maple syrup. Small sugar shacks in Quebec found it hard to compete on the international market, and the domestic market in Canada was too small for many producers to make a living. So much so that many farmers started to cut down their maple trees and sell it for wood, thinking that the sap inside was completely worthless. So, in 1958, a group of producers in the Beauce region outside of Quebec City came together to collectively market their syrup to try to gain a better advantage on the international market. And by 1966, this had grown into La Fédération des producteurs à céréales du Québec, or the Federation of Maple Syrup Producers of Quebec, which was founded to coordinate a larger agreement between all of the maple syrup producers in the province. In 1989, a joint agreement was signed by 84% of the producers in the province, which created a collective agreement for the production and marketing of maple syrup across Quebec. This turned the federation into a sort of legal cartel, controlling the production and the marketing of maple syrup, similarly to how OPEC controls the production of oil from countries like Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, and Russia. By 2002, La Fédération founded a maple syrup sales agency, becoming the only legal seller of bulk syrup in Quebec. All producers in Quebec were now required to sell to the Federation, and less than two years later they would pass a policy on production and marketing that would set limits on how much syrup an individual could produce and at what price the cartel was going to buy the syrup from them. The Federation would send agents to come check on your sugar shack, they would cut down any trees or any vacuum lines that went over the production quota, and they would slap their sticker of ownership right on the barrel before it even left the producer's hands. A growing group of producers in Quebec found that the Federation-turned-cartel had started to use scare and intimidation tactics to control the producers, and was no longer representing their interests at the international market. And some of these producers would start to revolt, hiding away a portion of their production and selling it directly to distributors in New Brunswick, who were outside of the purview of the law in Quebec. By 2008, the production level was organized to such a point that the Federation founded the National Strategic Maple Syrup Reserve, which was touted to be Canada's Fort Knox of maple syrup, which was a central warehouse to keep excess syrup produced on good years to then be sold out to the market on harder years, which ensures a continued income for the Federation's producers. Let's say a large producer made 600 liters more than they were supposed to that year. That syrup would then be put in a barrel into the strategic reserve, kept there until a later date, and then one year when they didn't do so well, that's resold, and at that point, the producer gets paid for the barrel. The Federation opened its first facility in Saint Antoine de Tilly for 6,300 tons, and then another facility in Placiville for 1,400 tons. And things were going quite well. 
Both facilities were owned and operated by La Federation, and with their treasures of sugary gold inside, they were almost as strategically important as the real Fort Knox. However, things started to fall apart in 2011. The cartel's producers had an amazing year, and they needed to expand the strategic reserve to a third location in saint louis de blanfort to hold another 4,500 tons of syrup. The warehouse was owned by the spouse of one Monsieur Avic Caron, who already had a storied history of fraud under his belt. Avic must have realized that they were sitting on top of a literal gold mine. The owners of the warehouse were responsible for its security, so besides a once annual inventory by Federation workers, Avic was almost entirely responsible for the security of the syrup. He reached out to one Richard Vallière, who had already made a name for himself by being a distributor of syrup that wasn't afraid to skirt the rules of the Federation. He had already been fined over $18 million in the past for purchasing syrup illegally from Quebec producers and selling them to distributors in New Brunswick at a higher rate than what the Federation would have charged. Richard is widely considered to be the mastermind behind the plan, and he went out and set up a number of smaller warehouses in small towns around southeastern Quebec. They would load up a truckload of the unmarked white barrels from the Federation warehouse and temporarily replace them with identical but empty barrels. They would truck the barrels to another warehouse, siphon out the syrup, and then go to a creek out back and fill them back up with water. The group included some Federation staff, family members of Monsieur Vallière, and a couple other unsuspecting helpers. For almost a year and a half, this complicated system worked, shuffling empty barrels around the warehouse so that everyone was technically accounted for, bringing barrels out to other warehouses, sometimes two or three truckloads at a time, and then replacing the water-filled barrels back into the Federation's reserve. By mid-2012, the perpetrators had lifted over 3,000 tons of syrup from the reserve, which was about 9,500 individual barrels. And this loot would be worth over $30 million if they hadn't started to get lazy. They stopped refilling some of the barrels with water, leaving some barrels in the warehouse empty for good. And they didn't necessarily take into account how water and syrup might interact with a metal barrel differently. The barrels that had been refilled with water had started to rust and decay and left a clear ring on the ground, whereas the barrels that were still filled with syrup hadn't changed at all. La Fédération came in the fall of 2012 to do their annual inventory, and the inspector was climbing around on the barrels just as they normally do. See, an inspector normally climbs to the top of the barrels to get their codes with ease because they're normally weighed down with 600 pounds of syrup. However, as the inspector reached to the top of the pile and found a barrel that was empty, only weighing a few pounds, it came tumbling down over them, almost sending the inspector to their death. The Federation started investigating. They quickly noticed the rings of rust on the floor and the dents in the barrels and quickly realized that it's got to be a lot bigger than they expected. It would take La Sûreté du Québec over 250 investigators to arrest 17 people in December of that year, and they wouldn't actually land a conviction until five years later. See, they were able to match the dent on the barrel to a particular kind of forklift, and then found out that one of the only people who had rented one of those forklifts around that time was directly connected to Monsieur Vallière. Avic Caron and Richard Vallière were arrested and charged in 2017. Vallière was sentenced to prison for eight years, plus a $9.4 million fine. There were three more men that were charged. The father of Monsieur Vallière, a driver who had transported the stolen syrup, and Monsieur Étienne Saint-Pierre of New Brunswick, who had apparently unknowingly purchased the stolen syrup from Monsieur Vallière and sold it on to producers and distributors in the United States, Germany, and Japan. Police were eventually able to recover some of the stolen syrup in warehouses in Quebec and in New Brunswick. However, one third of the syrup was never recovered, assumed to have been sold to people overseas who didn't know that it wasn't legitimate and have since eaten it. In the end, the missing syrup was valued at about $18.7 million. It may not have been gold, but it seemed to be worth just as much to these men. They thought that with a little bit of cunning, some plastic pipe and a creek out back, they would be able to rip off the Federation for millions. But instead, it was because of a lack of cunning, a little bit of laziness, and some empty barrels that the whole system came crashing down. Happy Canada Day, everyone.
Thank you so much for coming to check out this Canada Explained video. As a new YouTube channel, it's an incredible help to us when you like, leave a comment, and subscribe. So thank you so much for checking out this video. Please share it with your friends if you found it interesting, and let us know what you'd like to see in the future. We are so happy that so many of you are coming along on this adventure with us, and we can't wait to see what other incredible topics we'll bring to you.